<laughs> the subject of orchid lingo today. Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I wonder if you are wondering what is there to talk about when it comes to spikes? Well, stick around and you will see where my fascination with spikes leads us in this video. And perhaps you will find the similar fascination or everything I say here throughout will resonate with you. Spikes, oh my goodness. They are the promise of things to come, the bearer of good news. But there are certain things about spikes that I find so fascinating, not just because they are going to hold buds and that the orchid is going to bloom. There's so much more to spikes that we need to be aware of, especially if we want to make sure that we actually get to see the blooms. So spikes are super precious. They give us this <gasps> moment, especially if it is a first time bloomer. But how are we going to get to see the blooms if we don't take care and marvel at the spikes while they grow, some to a significant length before they finally bloom? And what can we do to make sure that they stay intact so that they can actually bloom and it doesn't burst our bubble because we either get bud blast or the spike frazzles up and dies, especially after 11 months of waiting to see a spike or even longer than that, if you've been taking care of a seedling, it can take five to six years and there is a spike. And then now what do we do? Instead of saying, yay, she's gonna bloom, it is not a guarantee that spikes will result in blooms, but it is a great step in the right direction. So the first thing when we see a spike coming out, of course, we're thrilled. But then how long does it take for it to bloom? My goodness, I will just put in the example of twinkles, twinkles. These hybrids have us absolutely yearning for the blooms because it's like, are you kidding me? Why is this little Oncidium complex hybrid doing this? And why is it taking so long? So a spike may appear and it can take another two months for an orchid to bloom. The health of a spike is paramount for us to see the bloom. So take note, if you haven't already, spikes are fragile. <laughs> and certainly maybe an elbow has snapped a spike and then suddenly another 11 months has to go by before another spike develops and we get a chance for blooming again. Many of those situations have happened in my time with my orchids, especially Phalaenopsis spikes or possibly Tolumnia spikes and it's all very frustrating. However, that is not all. Let me tell you that a spike will develop as well if an orchid is stressed. And at that point in time, a considered decision has to be made if you see a spike on a stressed orchid, whether you want that orchid to bloom or not. A stressed orchid is going to produce a spike because spikes equal flowers, which equals reproduction, which equals the survival of the orchid. The amount of energy a spike drains from a growth or the entire orchid is detrimental to the survival of the orchid, let's say in our collection, we can control that. So as much as we like our spikes, as, as much as we want to see our spikes bloom out and see the blooms of our orchid, that's what we are growing them for, there comes a time to be able to judge whether an orchid is in stress mode. And usually that would be signs of shriveled pseudobulbs or smaller growths on the leaves or root loss. And then suddenly an orchid will start pushing out spikes in order to flower because it is about to die. And that spike and subsequent blooms are the swan song for the orchid. At that point in time, I would always say cut the spike off. It is one of the hardest things to do as a grower, but for the survival of the orchid, the amount of energy it takes to grow a spike makes it paramount that the stressed orchid is conserved and saved from that energy consumption so that the hormones start to kick in again and will produce either a new structure, which produces new roots, or 
depending on the orchid, will just produce new roots based on its growth cycle. Either way, the energy consumption for a new structure or new roots is much more important than the energy consumption for producing a spike and then letting the orchid bloom because all of that delays for about four, maybe eight weeks before the orchid then starts a new growth if you let a stressed orchid bloom out. By that time, it is probably far too late to save the orchid because now we're talking another couple of months before new structures grow. And by that time, it's probably depleted. So a spike is a fabulous thing 80% of the time in our collection, but 20% of the time we need to weigh the odds whether we want to see the blooms or not. That's okay, 20% will take it and hopefully the orchid is then saved and then eventually we will see spikes again. When it comes to Phalaenopsis, however, if they are stressed and fighting for survival, they will produce one spike after the other, even if you cut the spike off. So bear that in mind. That doesn't mean the orchid is healthy. Keep those spikes cut off. There's one thing you can do, however, when it comes to Phalaenopsis, especially complex hybrids, and we see that a lot in keikis, is a keiki will grow very, very quickly a new spike, but it isn't ready to carry the load or consume all that energy. So if you decide to cut the spike off for the health of your keiki, then I highly recommend to at least let it consume the energy all the way to when you see buds forming, separating themselves off the spike and you're tricking the orchid that it is going to bloom and only at that point in time cut the spike to preserve the energy for the weak orchid to then recover. If you cut a spike too soon, for example on a Phalaenopsis, when it's just growing and hasn't even shown buds yet, that'll just trigger another spike on a stressed fowl and it'll do that over and over again for as long as you keep cutting those spikes off prematurely, draining your orchid of the energy. So allow it to grow out for a little bit, let the buds separate from the spike, and then cut it, and more often than not, that has given the orchid and its hormones that it triggers enough time to recognize it is going to bloom, and everything else after that will then kick into place sooner, as opposed to prematurely cutting a spike, and the orchid hasn't had the hormones to react to not growing any more spikes, and that is very, very often the case in Phalaenopsis complex hybrid, and usually keikis. Spikes are also super, super fragile. <laughs> uh, how many times has one knocked a spike off, cracked it, snapped it? Very, very disappointing. It is such a gut-wrenching moment. At least in my case, it takes me a couple of days to recover from a snapped spike. Uh, oh well, in some cases, spikes will also branch. So if you have snapped a spike on a Phalaenopsis, for example, at a point where there's still a growth node beneath it, no worries, it will branch. And then you still have some flowers. You still have that kick in the gut feeling. But in the case of a Phalaenopsis complex hybrid, it will branch. In some cases, nope, if you've broken a spike, then... It was nice seeing it grow, treat the orchid as per usual, and 11 months down the line, there will be another one. So yeah, very, very fragile. In many cases though, an elbow or leaf cleaning or any accident will not avoid snapping a spike. But what we can do at least to get a spike to health is provide a lot of calcium to the orchid as it is growing its spikes. It helps also with the strength of the spike, being able to carry the load of the blooms afterwards, which makes for a more upright presentation without having to support the blooms. Again, it won't risk elbows <laughs> and it won't risk leaf cleaning, but the guarantee of a very, very strong spike can be supported by adding calcium nitrate or having a high calcium fertilizer while the spikes are developing. The orchid exudes a lot of energy for the spikes. All the nutrients are being pushed into the growth of the spike because again, the blooms that it wants to produce are there for reproduction. These creatures want to survive. We enjoy the blooms. The orchid has other reasons for blooming. So pushing a spike, healthy growth, 
calcium. And if you don't have enough calcium and you have a very, very strong cattleya, for example, then calcium nitrate when you see a sheath growing or you see a spike forming because sometimes we don't even see a spike as in the case with cattleyas, for example. Some prostechias also come with sheaths. We won't see that spike at all because that is developing away from our line of vision. It is developing within the sheath. But at the point of a sheath growing, calcium nitrate, any kind of supplement, calcium magnesium, Anything with calcium will support the growth of a very, very healthy and strong spike, making for a better bloom presentation. What else spikes can do is if you train them, bloom presentation segues perfectly into the presentation of a spike. A spike that is long enough, or not even if it's short, it will always direct itself into the brightest light source. So the direction of any spikes as they grow will always show you where your ideal light source is coming from, whether it is a reflection of a white wall, especially again on let's say Phalaenopsis in my case, I have a very, very bright grow space but I don't supplement with any artificial lights for most of the time that my spikes are growing. So even as the sun comes in from one direction of the window, my spikes will actually move towards the white wall because according to them and their senses, they say that reflection has the brighter light. So if you see your spikes going away from any kind of light source you thought was ideal according to your naked eye, watch what your spikes do as they grow, whether you are right in what you see or which direction are they heading in because it might be contrary to what you believe is the direct light source. And with that, either one can turn the orchid around and move it so that the spike develops towards your light source or bring it closer to your higher light source. And then maybe the spike goes a little bit wonky, but at least it might curl in the direction that you would like it to grow. If you do not have the space requirements for a spike of a Phalaenopsis, for example, to grow to that length, then just let it grow in the direction it wants to grow and just keep an eye on it because eventually when the buds open, hopefully by the time the spike is long enough, the buds will grow towards what you believe to be the correct light source because the length of the spike will then also go into a direction that is a bit darker and eventually it'll correct itself. It'll look a little bit weird, maybe like an S shape, but at least blooms will follow. So you can also stake a spike if that makes life easier. It is also a way of protecting a spike that you don't want to break. It is also a space saver to stake a spike. Personally, if I can help it, I let my orchids do what they want and I position them in such a way that I hope to get the direction of the spike to grow according to a reflective wall. And that makes my life easier with regards to when I move them or as in my case, I have to bring them out. In my case, my telumnias, I bring them out and I always face them in the direction of my reflective facade. And when I bring them in again at night, the same thing applies. They get positioned on a tray in such a way that all the spikes face in the right direction, which helps me to then hang them up again next day, knowing what direction my spikes are in and not snapping them because Tolumnia spikes can also get very, very long and they take a long time to bloom out. Protecting Tolumnia spikes is quite the challenge, especially if your circumstances are like mine and you're moving your orchids around a lot to benefit from natural light. Fragile, no matter how much calcium you put into a spike. Once again, warning, elbows and cleaning leaves. Got to be very, very careful. Spikes are also not always anticipated from the same place. Cattleyas will develop sheaths. We don't know if anything's developing. The sheath can go brown and we're still waiting. So they're hidden from view. Some spikes will just go straight out of the apex of a unifoliate cattleya and woohoo, we know we're hopefully gonna get blooms if all goes well. 
However, spikes don't just develop from the apex of a leaf, they also develop from the base of an orchid itself, like an Epidendrum stanfordianum. A spike will look like a natural growth. And only when it doesn't start to leaf out and stays pointy, do you realize that what you thought was a new growth is in actual fact a spike. Same with a Capia walkeriana, comes out from the base. Some dendrobiums, for example, will produce spike from one apex several years back to back and that's why we get such pretty shows because the spikes repeat themselves and one apex is serving a purpose for multiple bloomings. Phalaenopsis, we know we need to have three leaves to grow before another growing point for a spike can develop but that is the complex hybrids. There are spikes for example on the summer bloomers, not necessarily the species per se, but let's say novelty hybrids, the summer bloomers that we have, they will produce spikes from one node on the opposite side from the next node. And these spikes are then considered sequential bloomers, meaning they will just bloom and bloom and bloom throughout the season, produce new buds. The diversity of spikes is amazing. Spikes are also very, very prone to pests. So watch out for that. There's a lot of happy sap on many spikes. So that attracts something like mealybugs. I get scale on my Tulumnia spikes, for example, this time of year, which is December 2021. Every spike that grows every day, I just make sure that my Tulumnia spikes are scale free. It's a jungle gym for bugs. So be very, very mindful that you cultivate and protect your spike if you want to see blooms. Aphids can get up there, ants can get up there, Mealybugs find the way up there. All sorts of things can go on with the spikes as they develop. And because they're nice, young and juicy, they will be sapped dry of whatever it is that is growing inside of them. And the spike can shrivel up and die. There's also the danger of, let's say, singeing a spike because of too much sun, not enough airflow. So be mindful of that as well. If you're under artificial light, watch the length of your spike. I don't have, for example, a shari baby or anything like that, but those spikes can get enormous and they will grow, as I mentioned, also towards the light. So your artificial lighting is all great when we talk about the distance between the leaf and the light source, but once a spike grows, as it gets taller and taller and reaches the artificial light, it will singe and burn. So be mindful of that. And the same applies with direct sun, hot sun, if there isn't any airflow. Everything, while a spike is developing, it is a game. There is no guarantee the orchid will bloom. We have to be really vigilant about our spikes as they grow. They can also rot in some cases if there's not enough airflow. They will just rot out because they are so tender as they grow between the leaf joints, between our pseudobulbs, as is the case with Oncidium types. And no matter how much calcium magnesium you throw in there, if there is a problem, if there is a bacterial infection, the best thing to do is cut that spike, unfortunately, but get rid of the infection, the safety and the life of the orchid is paramount. So you see, a spike does not guarantee blooming. So when I see a spike, I'm all excited, especially on first time bloomers. And then very, very quickly, reality kicks in as to getting that orchid to bloom because the disappointment of breaking a spike is, well, like I said, it takes me two days maybe to get over it. <laughs> Spikes have so much energy in them. Everything that's being pumped up into the growing point and the extension of a spike is as and they are great opportunities for propagating, especially once again, Phalaenopsis spikes. So I saw a video of Daniel's orchid ranch and saw that she had cut a spike to enjoy the blooms of a Phalaenopsis. And that spike is actually growing a keiki. In her very, very recent video, you will see that spike is growing a keiki, but it is in a water jar with no roots. I have done the same thing I had to try. Daniel's Orchid Ranch has so many things that I have been trying to emulate in the past four or five years, which I have not been very successful at, but I keep trying because she absolutely fascinates me with what she is capable of doing. 
So yeah, propagation method of a spike, but they propagate themselves as well. If you, for example, have a Tolumnia spike, it is not just one blooming at the end. Many, many times, Tolumnia spikes will branch as well. So they are a little bit more forgiving if they were to get snapped. You don't have to cut a spike off, obviously, if you want to propagate it. Often, often a spike will just branch and maybe eventually develop a cakey. You could use any kind of hormone to encourage that. I'm not a hormone fan apart from seaweed. I don't want to add any kind of hormones to my nodes, but it is possible and it can be done. Imagine now that you have pollinated your blooms. Again, the strength of the spike to hold a seed pod over a considerable amount of time that needs to be cultivated. So much going on with spikes that I thought I would bring to your attention. And I hope that this subject matter wasn't boring. It is not just an organism that is growing to give us blooms. There is so much more to a spike that we need to be aware of, especially how to make sure that it grows out so that we see the blooms. I love the colors of spikes, how they differ from the orchid itself, from the blooms it's going to produce. Also, how they have different textures. Slipper orchid spikes are fuzzy and just amazing. There's so much variety in a spike that keeps me interested and much more vigilant when it comes to making sure that they grow healthy and that they will bloom. Bringing these points to your attention, I would like to know if you've made it this far. <laughs> If you feel the same way about spikes or what observations you have made throughout your experience when your orchids get ready to bloom. Personally, it is a structure that fascinates me as well, that has me in high stages of anticipation, but very, very close behind are high stages of panic and trepidation that something might go wrong. So in between all the footage I've been showing you, I have also shown you footage of a video I did for September about all the spikes that I have noticed throughout my collection over this past year. But what you're also looking at is a couple of spikes of my Dendrobium lutein blanc that is a first time bloomer. And the spotting on these spikes, oh, I love it. Never mind that the buds are showing spotting as well. I have looked at these spikes now for the past two months and it is the spotting as they were progressing and growing that had me totally fascinated. And yes, it is a first time bloomer and that's why I brought this one out as my little background orchid while I talk through my fascination of spikes and how you can protect them. So, <laughs> orchid lingo, I told you it could be duh. But maybe in this video it wasn't all duh. Maybe in this video I thought, wow, I hadn't thought of that. Or maybe because of this video you will go back to your collection and have a closer look as your spikes develop and what direction they're heading in and if you're giving your orchid enough calcium for the spikes to form. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for letting me geek out over spikes. <laughs> I loved talking about them and I hope that you enjoyed this video. I appreciate your time. I wish you a beautiful, beautiful day on one condition that you stay safe, please. Take care. Bye.